Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I'm very pleased to be speaking in this debate as a former secondary school teacher over 23 years' experience. And I'm very grateful to the member for North Norfolk for bringing this debate forward. Um, this is an issue which he has direct personal experience of, and he's spoken about very movingly. And I think we would all agree that the member from North Norfolk has moved this debate forward, certainly in England, where much more focus has been placed on this issue. There's no doubt that mental health is something over the past 20 years we've all started to become uh, more aware of, and how widespread these challenges are in our society. And the member for North Norfolk has articulated um, the importance of continuing to move this agenda forward. And that's, that's a very good thing, because awareness of the different forms of mental health issues and the different forms they can take and the challenges they pose um, to our society, then, then the better equipped and educated we are as we try to deal with them. And this is never more true than in a school setting. We know that teenage years can be challenging in and of themselves as young people grow and discover who they are and try to find their own way and their own path in life. But mental health issues not addressed in these formative years can scar a young life forever. Indeed, as the member for Bury St Edmunds has pointed out, it indeed scars the whole family unit and causes real pain and anxiety for the whole family unit. We often hear governments talking of attainment and teaching and learning, nurturing and citizenship and inclusion. But none of these things are possible in their truest sense unless our children and young people enjoy good health and good mental health. And the statistics outlined by the, the Honourable Lady for Bridge End are truly shocking. And apart from the human cost, of course, we need to consider the huge economic cost to this. All who have contact with young people are charged with creating a supportive, positive and fostering environment. Of course parents have a role to play, but things may manifest themselves in school that don't manifest themselves at home. So all who have contact with young children must be vigilant. And schools have a very privileged and a very important role in child protection. In my time in education, I can actually think of examples when it was through the vigilance of a particular teacher that a young person who was struggling was identified and thereafter offered vital support, shielding the young person from falling into a downward spiral of problems and despair. In Scotland, child and adolescent mental health services are linked to and work with young people referred to them by their schools. And the number of these mental health professionals has more than doubled under the current Scottish administration. Of course, we all welcome the extra £15 million announced by the UK government to help tackle mental health issues in young people because we know that um, this is very important to achieving positive outcomes. I want to say a word or two, Mr Chair, if you'll permit me, um, to some of the, about some of the work that's been ongoing in Scotland for a number of years. In Scotland, we've already built up support networks at the level of early intervention to ensure that young people, parents and health professionals, as well as schools, are much more aware of what to do to help young people who are beginning to show signs of mental distress. In addition, we've already seen good examples of staff in schools being upskilled in areas such as mental health first aid. And some schools have actually involved young people in these mental health first aid um, training programmes so that they can support their peers, which may go some way towards tackling the stigma outlined by the Honourable Member for North Norfolk. In Scotland, we're getting better at this since the level of demand on, on young, and adult, young and adolescent mental health service has increased year on year with a 10 to 20 per cent increase in those starting treatment every year. In part, this has been driven by the unmet need that we know has always existed around the entire United Kingdom and is, and is now being picked up by GPs and staff in schools and other children's services. We're getting better, but we're not there yet, and there can be no room for complacency in such a serious, widespread and important issue. But I would point out that for a number of years now, Scotland has had a dedicated Minister for Mental Health, which is a symbol of the kind of commitment that this enormous social issue confronting us requires. 
The new measures announced by the UK Government are good, of course they are, as far as they go. But let's not forget that in the past we know that the a fierce advocate for mental health in the member for North Norfolk has already pointed out that mental health funding has not always made it to frontline services where it is very much and desperately needed and that has to be addressed. And I note the comments about waiting times and I would say to the Minister today that Scotland was the first nation in the world to introduce waiting time targets for children for child and adolescent mental health services in 2010. And I think that's a good path for the UK government to think about going down. Um, unfortunately, in 2015, um, people in England have been told that to have such waiting time targets are not feasible. Well, I would like to know if that's not feasible, why is it not feasible? If it can be done in Scotland, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be done in England. Every constituent part of the UK needs a coherent mental health strategy that is ambitious and bold to address the scourge of poor mental health, which has a huge effect on society. The SNP Scottish Government will be setting out its vision for mental health for the next 10 years to transform mental health care in Scotland, including for children and young people, funded to the tune of £5 billion over this parliamentary term, prioritised despite enormous budgetary pressure. It's this kind of big thinking, this joined up thinking, that all those living with poor mental health need wherever they live in the United Kingdom. And I'm interested in the plans the Minister will set out today. And I would ask the Minister to look at some of the excellent work being done in Scotland to see what lessons can be learned to improve the situation in England.